Okay, everyone, this is uh, a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, and uh, we're just getting started here. Again, laparoscopic, for those that are not familiar with uh, the terms, medical terms, of course, a whole different language. Uh, that means it's going through the abdomen, and thoracoscopic is chest, and arthroscopic is going to be joints. As you can see here, I've got the liver lifted up with a retractor called the Nathanson retractor. So we're looking towards the head from the belly button and around in that area. And the first thing I'm going to do is find the pylorus. That is the muscle that separates the stomach from the duodenum, or first part of the small bowel. See that little smudge on the camera, so we're going to try and get some of that smudge off. See how successful we are. It doesn't look like we're successful, for, so we're going to have to... We have a cleaner for the camera, which is a 5 millimeter camera. Now it's going through what we call the trocar. Still a little smudge on that bottom part, uh, but no big deal. So we're going to find the pylorus, and um, you can see me looking for it here with my other, and I, there I found it right over here. See that muscular type area over here. Straighten out my ruler, which is cut to what I want it to be. So I'm going to measure uh, from the pylorus what we call um, proximally or towards your mouth, if you want to put it that way. So I'm looking at centimeters here, and I've got the pylorus down there, and I've got it marked out to six centimeters. I mark that at six centimeters, and uh, that's going to be a mark I'm going to use for what this vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Again, this um, is, uh, we call it for short sleeve gastrectomy, but it's vertical, meaning uh, north to south, or from your head to your foot, kind of the way to think about it. Now that's the main marking I'm going to use because you can't get you can't cut too close to pylorus or you get into problems there. So what you want to do is you want to be off the pylorus a little bit, and in fact you uh, you get the effect uh, that you want uh, without getting into that area. So we're going to clean the camera again here. Again, a five millimeter camera, and these five millimeter cameras they have changed uh, everything as far as uh, uh, just being able to operate and the, these are HD cameras and uh, what we're able to do with these is just amazing really and then this is a special instrument that um, seals the vessel and cuts at the same time and not just the vessel but the tissue around it so I'm on the greater curvature of the stomach and I'm first going to get into what we call the lesser sac and you're going to see the underside or the retrogastric area as I get through that. And I'm just using this device um, that seals and cuts at the same time to enter this area so that I can um, perform the sleeve gastrectomy, which you'll see as we continue. And again, the sleeve gastrectomy is a procedure that we use. I think now it's the most common, if not very close to the most common, weight loss surgery that's done in the world. And um, so uh, many people have had this done. Now you can see the underside of the, of the uh, stomach there, what we call the retrogastric uh, area or the uh, lesser sac. I'm going to work backwards to that mark that I've made so that I can get uh, my measurements just right as you see uh, as we work through the surgery. Again, lifting up and sealing and um, working towards and I have my assistant, who's usually one of my mid-levels, a PA or a nurse practitioner, holding the other side. And this actually is an assistant-dependent um, operation because you'll see it in the future. It takes a little bit as we go along in the procedure. And there he is uh, moving the uh, tissue, so bring it towards me so that I can go through that with our sealer divider. And again, it's not a big deal if I get stomach right here because I'm actually going to take that part of the stomach out. So if, you, if you're wondering what is, the heck is going on, then what you want to do is look at a little anatomy book um, or even bring it up on, uh, on images on Google and you'll see the stomach. And we're going, again, we're going along the greater curvature of the stomach. I made a mark just right at the area of the antrum of the stomach. We're going up the body of the stomach now on the greater curvature side. And we're just taking down all these vessels that feed uh, this portion of the stomach we're going to work up north. And again, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, the two most common operations done for weight loss are going to be your gastric bypass, which 
a lot of people have heard about before, and that uh, is the gold standard operation. It has its issues, though. It has a higher uh, risk profile, um, and uh, also uh, it's both a procedure that is malabsorptive and a procedure that is restrictive. A sleeve gastrectomy, a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, is restrictive. It's not malabsorptive. We're not going to change any of the bowel like you do in a bypass. And I do have videos of bypasses, so we'll be able to watch those at another time. Um, but this is purely restrictive. It leaves the uh, bowel in continuity. And uh, so people favor that because it has a lower risk profile. Um, and uh, it is primarily restrictive without being malabsorptive. And so your complication rate is reduced. There's a cost, and I don't mean a monetary cost. What I mean by cost is uh, the bypass results are slightly better overall than uh, the sleeve gastrectomy as far as weight loss is concerned. However, if a person abides by the four tenets of weight loss surgery, that being uh, the surgery, the diet, the exercise, and the support group, you can get just as good of an effect from a sleeve gastrectomy as you can from a bypass. And in fact, we all know as surgeons who deal in this area that you can get weight regain bypasses in your office. You can fill up your office with weight regain bypasses. So it's not just the surgery. There has to be some individual uh, accountability. And that's why the exercise, um, diet, and support group uh, and that helps people get through. Now, we're always trying to assist people in uh, really a change-of-life procedure and to help them out. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to come down to you can cheat any operation and uh, them doing that or not fulfilling the other uh, items of weight loss surgery. Now, I'm just taking down some bands because you'll see I'm going to use a special kind of a clamp. We call it the standard bariatric clamp. Uh, to uh, assist in standardizing the procedure. Um, so anyways, the, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy, as far as people, the, probably the biggest problem I see, and every bariatric surgeon can speak for themselves, the biggest problem I see as far as weight regain is not necessarily cheating on the diet, although some people do. <clears throat> and I just want to say that surgery is much more successful than any diet program. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it, but it is a whole programmed approach. So the biggest problem that I see with people as far as uh, weight regain is not some problem with the surgery. It generally is not exercising. So I can get most people to follow a diet, a reasonable diet. There are going to be some, especially your sweet eaters, who may um, stray off that diet. Uh, but really the problem uh, most of the time is uh, exercise. And I don't really ask for anything. In fact, I don't want people to go to the gym unless they're used to going to the gym. Because people who depend on going to the gym, ultimately, if they're not used to that, will stop going to the gym. So what I ask people to do is walk. <clears throat> so I set them out for a program. Generally, when I see them postoperatively, uh, not so much the initial postoperative uh, uh, visit, but subsequent visits, I'll talk to them uh, about an exercise program or a walking program. Now just in front of me is the spleen. We're getting to an area of the dissection that is uh, can be uh, challenging uh, because sometimes uh, there's a lot of scarring or um, uh, vasculature um, or to the spleen from the uh, stomach. And so you kind of have to be careful up in this area. Not that you don't have to be careful in the rest of the area, you do. But um, even more so as we approach the spleen here. Now you can see we're trying to get a good view, lifting up and looking under and over uh, to see um, everything that we can see. And as you see, as I start to pull towards me, some of these vessels can be elongated. So I could almost be sealing them and dividing them long way, which I don't want to do. I want to div divide them perpendicularly. So as you can see me trying to achieve that um, as we go along, getting underneath there get a 90 degree angle as much as I can to what, where I think the vessels are. And sometimes, especially in very big people, uh, finding the vessels can be a challenge. And, um, and so that can be an issue. Um, but in most people, the vast majority, uh, these you can go uh, through here pretty uh, very safely. 
Now, um, there's there's always surgeries that are easier than others, and there's uh, ones that are pretty typical. And this, I would say, is a pretty typical sleeve up to this point. There can be some very difficult operations from a variety of reasons. Oftentimes, they're related to body habitus, so the shape of a person, where they carry, carry the fat, and so forth. So uh, there's there's a variety of body habituses, and there's some of them. You can see me double uh, sealing that there. You're not really sure where the vessels are. You kind of are limited uh, because you have a certain number of instruments. And you see me going over the stomach here and trying to get the stomach out of the way. And I'm going to see my assistant, and he can pull the stomach and not, not a lot. This probably is a female because a lot of males, you can't do this maneuver. That fat that's right to the right of me will come up there and obscure where I'm dissecting. But a lot of females kind of tend to carry their uh, fat in a area that's a little more easy to operate through. Um, and this is an example of that. He's able to grab the stomach and even pull it more away from where I'm working so that I can get to where I want to be. And the spleen is right to the right, right of me, right upper. And I'm just taking down those attachments to the spleen right now. In this position I am right now, I'm not too worried about vessels, although there could be some right in that corner that I'm taking right now. Um, but still, as you get closer to what we call the left cruise, which you're going to see in just a minute, um, that becomes less and less of a problem unless you go towards the patient's back uh, or por posterior. Now you can see the left cruise coming into view as I'm trying to sweep it away. And again, this is all, everything that we're doing is in preparation to complete the operation. You can see I'm pulling up the greater curve, like into the lesser curve there. I'm looking to see what else I need to get to allow for my clamp to put in there. And you see some attachments I'm going to take down right there. Now, in this patient, um, the you can see just below me there's a salmon color structure just right underneath my uh, uh, vessel sealer right there. Right in there, below the vessel sealer, is going to be the pancreas. So we're not going to get into that because we don't want to get into that. You don't, you don't want to scare the pancreas. You don't want to have the pancreas be a problem because that can ruin everyone's day. The patient's number one, but everybody else involved Um Pancreas is hard to deal with if you get a problem with But it's right there. I'm almost pushing at it a little bit. And it has a little capsule to it. Um, filmy capsule, like I'm telling you. In fact, right to the lower left there, just left of my vessel here, you can see the pancreas very well. And it sits right underneath the stomach. And that's why we can sometimes do surgeries. Uh, and I'm taking down those attachments right over the pancreas. That's why we can do th surgeries through the stomach and into the pancreas sometimes. We call that cyst gastrostomy. That's for chronic pancreatitis with what we call a pseudocyst. But that's a whole different subject. That's not what we're dealing with right now. But right uh, near my dissection there is the pancreas. Right above the pancreas sits the uh, stomach. So I'm taking down these last attachments, and you'll see why in just a minute. I'm taking down these last attachments, um, freeing up the stomach entirely, uh, yet being careful not to get too close to the lesser curve. So again, I'm on the greater curve. And again, look at your anatomy or your images, and you can see uh, I'm headed towards the lesser curve, but I don't want, really want to get in that direction. So I'm taking down these final attachments so that I can get my clamp in preparation to complete the uh, surgery um, as we kind of work through this. Again, the pancreas right underneath me. Now, you may ask those little white areas, little, uh, you might say, thermal injuries. Those are not a big deal. The uh, uh, And you can see the stomach nicely there, uh, out in the, just a natural thing. Now, I'm bringing in the standard bariatric clamp. This is a clamp to standardize the um, result every time. So I'm going to place this clamp by pulling. Now, this is where the, uh, the uh, assistant becomes very important. I'll place this clamp um, to... to perform the sleeve gastrectomy, but in, in, in a standard fashion for every single patient. In other words, what I don't want to do in surgery or I want to try and prevent is variation. I want to keep the surgeries the same in everyone, or as close to the same as I can. So we're pulling through, and uh, we're going to get really close to uh, the junction between the esophagus, which is to my left. You see that fatty area? And then the stomach here, he, we're pulling out the fundus of the stomach. Again, you can check your images. And I'm coming up to the what we call anterior fat pad. It doesn't have much of an anterior fat pad. But I'm going to come up close to it, but I don't want to go too far uh, towards the um, what we call the hiatus, which is just to the left of me there. And that's the diaphragm right above me. And again, the, the liver's right above me. 
uh, the spleen right in front of me, and I've got the uh, standard cramp now, a big clamp across the stomach, and I'm going to pull back to that six centimeter mark. Do you remember that? I'm going to pull back to that, and I'm going to clamp it down. Now this this clamp with a 18 French bougie, or excuse me, 18 French OG uh, oral gastric tube, which is the anesthesiologist is going to put down just in a minute. Now, right where I'm grabbing is a very important area. That is the point of restriction, okay? And I'll talk about that in just a minute. You can see a nerve that's right underneath that meat there, too. But a uh, point of restriction, I'm just pulling that out just so he can get his OG or oral gastric tube in so that we can size this sleeve again to make it standard size. When completed, this equals about a 40 to 42 French bougie. And our, normally, our esophagus is about 60 French. So this is smaller than our esophagus, typically. 40 to 42 French. I used to do these just under bougie at 30, just without the standard clamp at a 38. But now I do a 40 to 42 because the lower size you get, the more likely you are to get a leak. Now I'm watching for the tube to come down. The anesthesiologist is placing it. Sometimes it's easier than others, and sometimes you have to kind of... Um, work with that uh, to get the uh, tube down. Sometimes it's slick, uh, sometimes it's uh, not so much. And it looks like we may be having, anesthesia may be having just a little bit of problem getting the tube down. Now this 18 size is fairly stiff, and so it goes down pretty uh, easily. And again, we put it through the mouth, not through the nose. It's not an NG tube because it's not a tube that we're going to have post-optively. And again, that little lobe uh, that you're looking at that's kind of looks like it's beating is part of the liver. All right, so um, trying to put this down. Again, I'm waiting for the anesthesia, and I think I see it maybe. Oh, there's, you see that vessel right there that's pumping uh, right there. I'm pointing at it um, with the camera, and uh, we're just waiting for this uh, uh, tube to get down. Sometimes it's difficult for the anesthesiologist to get it even down the esophagus for various reasons. And then, uh, again, we're putting a little... Uh, pressure on it, so sometimes it's difficult to get it through where I want them to get it. But we're going to make sure it's placed appropriately because if you don't, you could end up with strictures and all kinds of problems that uh, can lead to further problems in the future, such as leak, or you have to do dilations, or you have to do bypass, uh, many things that have to be done sometimes in those situations. So again, we're waiting, and it's a team effort. We have anesthesiologists, we have myself, the surgeon, and we have... Uh, uh, the mid-level uh, uh, assistant, as I've indicated, we have a scrub tech, a nurse in the room, and then an orderly, oftentimes available at least. They may be, orderlies may be in a couple of different rooms, uh, but um, there's it's a team effort. So sometimes, like I say, the team is uh, struggling a little bit in one area, and right now we're struggling a little bit with the anesthesia part of it. But that's okay, because uh, it's important to see that everything in surgery doesn't go perfectly, and that's one of the reasons why I don't edit these videos, except for parts that really need to be edited. Uh, I don't edit them because um, it helps you to see that things are not always the way that uh, you want them to go. So you always kind of have to uh, work with the work with the team and work with the situation to see if you can get things improved. So I think, uh, see if we can see him getting it down uh, at this point or getting a little closer. Again, liver to the left of me, that's kind of that reddish toned uh, organ. Um, you can see the pylorus even above me up to the left there. Um, the stomach we've already identified. The lesser curve is to the left of me. The greater curve is to the right of me. Um, we're kind of looking near the at, at an area of the stomach to be called the body of the stomach. The diaphragm's uh, up top there. Uh, with the esophagus coming through where that fatty tissue is to the right, upper right. Um, so that's kind of the anatomy. And again, uh, you can check the anatomy uh, by looking at images on Google or a text that does um, anatomy uh, and those types of things. So we're still, looks like we're still struggling. You know, we, you can reduce these cases by... Uh, um, May, uh, you know, in each one of these areas, if you're more efficient in each one, say, for instance, you have a little bit better body habitus, um, 
then uh, you can get things done more quickly and we'd be on to the next step. But but we're waiting and we're waiting for the team, waiting for the anesthesiologist to be able to pass that tube where we need it to. Now, what happens if I can't get it down or there's some problem? And I certainly have had that in the past. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, but what would I do? Well, I'd back up and do uh, the procedure with a, a bougie, which is a dilator. And uh, it's a rubber tube that we place down. <clears throat> And you can do it across that. It's just that the reason I don't use that is because um, it's a similar operation in my hands. It may be different for different people, but in my hands, it's a similar operation each time, but it's not the standard thing that you get almost every single time with this uh, specialized clamp. So I think I see a little bit of uh, coming down there. And again, it's crucial um, that we get it down appropriately. Um, and that we see it go down so that we know past that critical area that I mentioned uh, that there's no, um, that it passes because we don't want to have a stricture. If you get a stricture in that, that location, that is very difficult. Problem, um, that's not very difficult. I mean, it's, you can take care of it, but it's not a problem you want to have, that's for sure, because it's just extra work. And uh, people <clears throat> are unhappy with that because of all the extra work. Now, you can see the time is taken. Uh, and again, in the operating room, sometimes we're fiddling with, with equipment. Uh, sometimes we're fiddling with uh, getting equipment. Um, different things, waiting for, for things to be done. And this, for really, the, almost the longest part of the procedure at this point has been waiting for the anesthesiologist to get the uh, NG tube down. And if you want, of course, you can always fast forward. But you may miss what I have to say about uh, this or other things. So remember, I want to go back to this uh, exercise issue while we're waiting. Um, the what I shoot for ultimately in my patients that are uh, at least two years out, what I want them to have by two years out is is in a diet where they're eating generally two to three meals a day that are high protein. Their snacks uh, should be high protein snacks, and um, then uh, exercise. I want them walking at least ten thousand steps a day. Now, some people will say ten, you know. Work out or do 10,000 steps three or four times a week. Um, that should be good, and I don't agree with that. The body, and again, it's opinion, and it's the way that I uh, deal with my patients and uh, other. Now, see, I'm going to loosen. I'm going to. Now, this is a good example of helping the anesthesiologist out. I'm going to pull the esophagus down a little bit. You saw me pull down, let go of the clamp, pull down, see if I can straighten it out for him. And uh, and so this is this is an issue. Now he's. Passed it through. I'm going to have him pull back the, uh, the tube. And he was able to get it down. And get him just to the right place there. You can see that, that uh, tube there. And I'm going to clamp back down and have him pass. So you can see this is an example of, um, you can see the tube going right through there. We're watching it now go right where it's supposed to go. I pass that important area, um, a small area. And uh, we're going to make sure this is in the right location. We're going to have him pull back and forth. You see the stomach moving. Um, well, that little bit of that is the vessels. But uh, we're trying to get this tube. And there it is, bumping up against that area that you can have a stricture. And so, again, this is a good example of trying to uh, uh, modify things so that you can um, get things to work well. So I'm going to lift that place plus up. Pull it out of my clamp a little bit and see if he can get that down. Um, and then we can always pull it top uh, in a, in a later. So he's bumping up against that area that's very critical. Because at that area, and you can see the tube as he pulled it back there a little bit, uh, inside the stomach. Now he's going to push. There it is. See it? Now it's going to go. And I'm pulling a little bit more out. He gets stuck again. Now we're just talking back and forth. And uh, so he's struggling with it. He's getting stuck right there. That's good and bad. I mean, he's taking extra time, but it's good because we're going to get a nice tight sleeve for this patient. And uh, once we get it through, okay. Now he keeps on pushing. You can see the tube there as I'm pulling some of the stomach that way to help him out a little bit. Um, don't always have to do this, but occasionally we have to do this uh, where we get things set in there. So, so as he uh, works that tube down, um, there we go. Now we're now we're cooking, got past the area that I'm concerned. That area right there is where you can get strictures. That is where 
you want the tightest point to be, though. So it's a happy medium. You want the, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tighten up the tube, and I'm going to put that right where I want it so I can make sure that I get that standard uh, sleeve. In other words, the sleeve is basically a tube. So you see where that stomach's going to be a tube. And I'm making sure that that NG tube is in the right location because I don't want to get a stricture there. But I know that I'll get an adequate uh, diameter if I have this uh, in the right, right uh, location, the standard clamp and the uh, OG tube. So I've got those in the right location. I'm just tightening up my stomach to make sure I can have a good sleeve so I'll have good restriction. You see, I've got to get it closer to the anterior fat pad, uh, closer to the incisura, so I have minimal fundus out there. I've got to have some fundus, but not a ton. You can't take all the fundus or you increase your rate of risk, of uh, excuse me, your rate of leak. So you don't want to take too much fundus. You don't want to be too close to the uh, uh, incisure there or too close to the what we call a GE junction, the gastroesophageal junction. So at that point I've been ta talking about that where you get the, the strictures and so forth, uh, remember what happens you, and, and the reason that you can be this operation. Now here's a linear cutting stapler. This is an Ethicon. Um, and uh, we are using different staplers now, so it's an older procedure, but we're going to place this uh, linear kind of stapler. It has three rows of staples on each side. It's a stapler that I can bend. So we're going to bend where that uh, staple gun actually is. And we can go right along that standard clamp so that we can get the sleeve. So the width of that standard clamp, the stapler, and the NG tube gives me a 40 to 42 bougie a size tube, which is what I want. Now you can see my assistant pulling that stomach to get it tight so that I can get a nice sleeve for this patient. And that's the width of uh, what they're going to be able to swallow through. Now remember, right at that point, or right at the tip of the uh, stapler, um, and this is a powered stapler, so it's going to go through here with power. Um, it's going to it's going to staple and cut all at the same time. Again, one of the very cool instruments that we get to use in surgery. But uh, cuts and it uh, staples all at the same time. Now that very critical area right there is um, that's the point where you can get strictures and what I've been talking about. But that's also the point of the greatest resistance. So it's a happy medium. That's why I want to be this very standard size every time um, because I have confidence in what that size and what the expectation, expectations will be post-surgery and patients how they do. In other words, I don't expect much nausea, vomiting, or dehydration in a patient uh, if I get the standard size every time. Again, going right up the clamp, and this clamp helps me make this a standard size every day. There are some limitations for the stapler that I have to work through. Um, and then we also take our time with stapling because what we're doing when we clamp down with the stapler is we're pushing out all the edema in the tissues. We're waiting a little bit, and then we're, we're deploying the stapler, which gives us a uh, three-row staple on each side and then cuts in between. So remember, when food comes down to that area that I've been worried about getting a stricture in, right there, uh, it gets stopped there. So then your pouch is actually proximal to that. So you, the way that you beat this surgery or bypass is you have liquids. You drink a bunch of, uh, of um, milkshakes and uh, smoothies and uh, things like that. But it's, that's why protein works. As you eat the protein, then it gets stuck right at that point. And then everything behind that builds up and makes a person full. So that's why they can't eat as much. Or at least that's the poor man's uh, reason why they can't eat as much. Um, because they're, uh, they have um, uh, created a resistance there at that point. So that's the key, really, of the surgery. The rest of it is maintaining, uh, you know, uh, or preventing problems like leaks, bleeding, um, strictures, that kind of a thing. And you can see we're, we're making sure that our stomach's nice and flat because we want to get a nice, it's easy to undercut some of these things. Now, these different colored staplers have different heights to the stapler. Now, this is a gold stapler. The other one was a green on Ethicon. And uh, so you, these are different heights of staple that have to do with different thicknesses of tissue. The closer you get up towards the end of my clamp there, the thinner the tissue is. So you have to have shorter stapler, staples. Now, my assistant's going to pull, and this is what I meant by the assistant is key in this operation. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a heavy requirements on the assistant because they have to be able to uh, help me in the operating room because I've got my two hands are taken care of by the standard clamp and by the uh, uh, staple gun. So I need an assistant to help me pull that out. So he pulls that laterally. 
Uh, again, we're just going to make a tube, and this is what we call vertical. This is why it's called a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, because it's up and down. It's north and south. It's from your uh, mouth to your feet, kind of. Uh, so we're going to lift this up a little more. We don't, we, you can easily catch too much, you easily leave too much fundus. So we're going to make sure that we got that fundus pulled out laterally. And uh, we're going to straighten that out as much as possible. This is the key area. Up here is where you get leaks. Because as you remember, the food gets stuck uh, right at that point of resistance that we, I've been pointing out. And also the point of strictures if you make it too tight. And then it backs up. And if it backs up and these staples fail up here, then you'll, you will blow that out, for lack of a better way to put it, or you get a leak right at the tip of the staple. So we want to make sure that this row is really good. might want to make sure that every row is really good, but you really want to make sure this row is, is appropriate. The other thing that we do is we make sure that the patient is on liquids for two weeks after the surgery. Studies have shown that that is an effective way also from the patient's perspective of preventing leaks uh, or reducing the rate of leaks. Uh, and you notice, uh, as if, if surgeons are watching this, you'll notice I don't use um, the uh, sealant devices that you can put on the stapler. Um, and some people like those and some people don't. There was a study several years ago that said that um, if you uh, use those reinforcements, you increase the rate of leak. If you don't use them, you increase your rate of bleeding. So it goes right between. But I'd rather have bleeding than a leak. And I did one time have a leak from using um, those um, strips, and so I prevented that. So you see, I took my time there to, to deploy that stapler, and uh, because I want to make sure, just like the other rows, that they are as um, uh, they're seated as well as possible. Now you can see just a little bit of corkscrewing um, there uh, in my stomach and my tube there. Um, and, but I think you get a little bit more of that when you do just the bougie, and that's one reason why I went to standard clamp. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to remove this remnant stomach, and we just discard it, unless we find some abnormality. So I have in the past found some things in this part, part of the stomach is very rare, but we, if we don't see anything or feel anything, we just, for lack of a better way to put it, we put it in the trash. We just get rid of it, because... Um, it's just extra fee to give to the pathologist to, to read out a normal stomach. Uh, it's not helpful. Now, this is the endo bag. We brought this bag. We deployed it, and we're going to have my assistant. I've got the bag open. My assistant's going to place the stomach into the bag, and um, we're going to pull the, that part of the stomach out. And, of course, as I mentioned, get rid of it. Now, the whole time I'm leaving the standard clamp on, uh, because uh, there's no evidence to it, but anecdotally, I think that what it does, it helps compress the vessels a little bit so I don't get as much bleeding. Now, one thing that we found between the Ethicon staplers and the Covidian staplers is Ethicons tend to bleed a little bit more. And uh, you'll see what I'll do for that, I think, in just a minute. I'm going to shake this down a little bit. I'm going to close that. I'm going to bring it out through the uh, that trocar, that port site, and I'm going to remove the stomach. And then uh, after we remove the stomach, uh, again, we're going to discard that. And I'm pulling on it right now, getting it out. And there's, I have a technique where I get it out of the uh, stomach. Uh, sometimes that can be a struggle if you are not aware of the tricks of the trade to get that out. But uh, over time, uh, you learn how to most effectively remove the stomach. Um, and, uh, and then uh, it's not as much of a chore. Um, again, leaving the camera in as we do that because usually this doesn't take that long. Um, and then what I'm going to do is uh, uh, get ready to complete the surgery. And that's going to be checking our uh, bleeding and um, being happy with that. Uh, so I'm going to undo. I've got the stomach out now. I'm going to undo the standard clamp. Um, and then uh, you can see the nice flat row of staples. Uh, there is a standard clamp that has a... Uh, uh, stapler in, device in it, but I have not been able to use that yet. But you can see how nice and flat it is. Just one, I'll, I think I'll probably pull this down. I generally do. I'll pull it down to see how nice and flat that is. And there's your point right there. I'm just pointing to it right there of, of resistance. And everything back behind there backs up. That's why you don't need uh, to go closer to the pylorus. That's your area of resistance. It's your, also your area that you have to be careful about as far as the stricture. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip 
Um, my partner and I, when we used Ethicons, this is, and even now occasionally, what we do is we'll clip the vessels, any bleeding that we see, because it's not worth um, having to transfuse or to go back on bleeding. Uh, so we're very aggressive. I have the um, anesthesiologist remove the uh, tube. That Remember that uh, OG tube that's not going to stay into the patient? But you can see with the standard clamp, I get a very flat staple line, not uh, corkscrewed, um, which some people think adds to some of the nausea and some of the uh, uh, reflux and problems like that. I mean, I think that's anecdotal. I don't think there's any hard evidence that shows that. But anything that looks a little bit bloody, I'm going to use this clip applier uh, to clip that. And uh, you can see I'm kind of going through and uh, clipping those. Um, and we've had pretty good luck with that. Uh, you, we've had some you know, bleeding here and there in the past, but before we used this, we, I used to over-sew the staple line. I used to put those um, uh, reinforcement strips on there. Um, a lot of different things. I did a lot of these where I re where I over sewed the first the upper uh, two thirds, and then uh, in surgery you 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 get a little bit uh, paranoid, and uh, you'll see me almost every time when I use this. I don't always use this clip applier. Uh, if there's no staple, I don't. If there's no bleeding, I don't use it. I'll go right to the end because um, all of us are so worried about leaks, and we you know. Sometimes we get these ideas in our head that we think that the clip is going to stop it, stop any leak, and I doubt that's the case. But generally, if I have the clip applier out, I'll clip a plus across that very tip because I want to uh, just feel better about things. Uh, getting a reload as well, but I, I'm getting there. Just a little, I had to hand that to the um, our scrub tech to get a reload of staples, or excuse me, of clips, and uh, finish this clipping. So you know, this kind of looks odd on an X-ray, but what happens is the Omentum, uh, that fatty layer that we've been dealing with, you know, clip the very end there. See how I go do that? Because it's just uh, one of those things that we just do as surgeons just to make, feel good about everything. So, uh, looks like I may have missed it there. I'm a bit happier with that. Okay, there we go. And uh, so I don't think I really got across the first time. But you see the tube. So you can see this tube and that now is uh, completed by this uh, surgery. I'm going to do some irrigation. I take my time in this location because I want to give some time to see if it's going to bleed because uh, I've been doing this long enough where everything looks dry and then, you know, six hours later you're back in the operating room dealing with the bleeding. I rarely have to do that, uh, but, you know, you occasionally have to do that. So I'm always trying to prevent any of those problems just by taking more time. There's the spleen up there again. And again, that's right where you'd get leaks up there. If you get a leak in the sleeve, typically that's where you're going to get them. Not always, but typically. And usually leaks happen in the first day to 10 days postoperatively. When you're two weeks out, you're, you're pretty safe, but you're not totally safe. There can be some late leaks um, later on uh, that can even be laid out. I've never seen one, but I, I go to these bariatric uh, conferences all the time. People present some of those cases. Uh, so we're just taking our time here. We're not going to be in a big hurry. Um, just making sure that I'm happy with everything, giving it time to bleed if it's going to bleed so I can stop that, making sure it's in a good location, taking a look at it, um, just taking good old time. And that's a pretty standard, pretty good looking sleeve. And the operation overall went very well. And so that's what I tell the patient's family. Uh, the only issue that we had was with the OG, but that is a really a non issue. That's just a delay in uh, the case, makes your case longer. And uh, that's what my assistant had there, that fatty tissue. That's what would be go up against the uh, sleeve. Now, what you're going to see here is we're going to close these, these bigger port sites or trocar sites because you can get hernias in those wounds. So I'm going to use what's called a toad stabber to do that. Uh, this device that we have that um, puts in a... You have to be careful, though. That's why the camera's looking at it. You can stab something with it, so you have to have a little bit of finesse. And uh, this is what hurts people postoperatively is a stitch through the what we call fascia. But you got to do that because you want to prevent a hernia in those wounds. And certainly over the years, uh, from myself and others, I've seen hernias in those wounds. They're not difficult typically to repair. Usually it's a, it's a outpatient short operation. But still it's a hassle for the patient. If you can prevent that with a single stitch and a little bit of postoperative pain, uh, uh, people are better off that way. Uh, furthermore, I mean, nowadays we use abdominal blocks. Um, and so those abdominal blocks where uh, the anesthesiologist puts local anesthesia on the, in the ab abdominal um, nerves, 
It's really been good, and I've had a lot of patients use no narcotics after this operation. Not all of them, obviously. Uh, people have different uh, um, limits to their pain, but uh, many uh, people I've had, uh, since we've been using the blocks, I haven't had to have any medications, maybe some Tylenol, um, and that's been it. But obviously, a lot of patients do take the pain medicine. And I'll tell you what, I even have gone against, I've even gone away from IV pain medicine postoperatively, just oral pain medicine because the block is good enough. And then uh, we let them drink fluids right after the surgery. We let them have fluids right after. That's how good these staple lines are. And uh, let them drink fluids right after the surgery so they can take a pill. And that's one of the fears of a lot of these patients. Can I take my pills, that kind of a thing? And they can. Years ago, when I first started bariatric surgery, I used to have people take liquids, but now I have them take pills. And we're finishing up the surgery now. I have them take pills because they can actually swallow them. Got more sleeve gastrectomies coming up with different problems, different issues, so look for that. Again, laparoscopic vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, we're just completing by... Uh, removing, you can see some edema and hematoma in the liver, but that will get better. We're removing the nathan retractor and uh, making sure everything looks the way we want it, no bleeding, and basically we are done with the operation, and we will look forward to the next.